doctors, there should be no such thing and we have to only see what works best for our patients. So, initially we were using aflibercept only in resistant cases where um, uh, the, the bevacizumab or ranibizumab were not effective and then as we started using it in the resistant cases, we realized that it has a lot of merits in terms of strength, speed and longevity of response. The speed of response gives better outcome. Longevity reduces the longevity reduces the treatment burden in terms of visits and the risk of infection. And best of all, this all comes with zero adverse events. The events of inflammation that we see with the brolicizumab or contamination with bevacizumab. So gradually it has become the drug of first choice in all indications and the idea for you program of course made it easier and also uh, concurrently there is an uh, re uh, the insurance regulatory authority has uh, mandated that intravitreal injections should be covered by the insurance companies. So that also helps the patients in going for the uh, injections. Now we know as a molecule aflibercept has a very high affinity binding to two molecules, it is a dual action VEGF and PGF and also it has a very long uh, duration in the vitreous. The clinical studies, the first study which was done with aflibercept was the VIEW 1 and VIEW 2 and that showed that in the second year almost 50 percent of the patients could be maintained on 12 weekly injections and even 12 weekly was because it was mandated that it cannot be extended beyond 12 weeks. If it were permitted to extend, it would have been a larger proportion. So in a real world study, more fields, 50% uh, of the patients could be extended to more than 12 weeks. And the Altair study with PCV and AMD also found that almost 60% of the patients could be extended to 12 or uh, longer week interval and 40% of these could be 16 week intervals. The Hawk and Harrier could find that 40% of the patients could be maintained on Q12 and Q16 was not tested, whereas aflibercept in the uh, Altair study had already shown that 60% of the patients can be maintained on Q12 and of these 40% actually on Q16. Now there is a newer uh, molecule Farisimab which has uh, got FDA approval uh, for AMD management and is likely to also come to India. That also has a very high um, duration in the eye and is a bispecific antibody that works on VEGF A as well as angiopoietin 2. So it also has a dual mode of action with long duration. Almost 80 percent of the patients can achieve more than Q12. However, in this study, the, 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 the Tena and the Lucerne trials which were done, Lucerne trials, Aflibercept was not allowed to be extended beyond two months. So it was not a comparative study. There was no head-to-head -head comparison in durability. So we cannot say whether aflibercept fared better than, equal to or worse than farisimab in this study. While farisimab could be extended, aflibercept was kept at its two monthly dosing. And uh, recently there is a paper from the UK where the specialists have uh, given a guidance on extending treatment to Q16 with aflibercept. There is also a new study from the Wilmer Eye Institute which has found that almost half the patients of AMD can go off treatment in the second year if they are on treatment with aflibercept compared to the uh, earlier drugs like bevacizumab. So it is three times more likely to be able to stop treatment at the end of one year which is a previously unappreciated advantage of aflibercept where we only talk of strength and longevity but not that it can put an end to treatment. So this is one of my cases, an elderly gentleman uh, with a PCV, RP detachment and you can see a polypoidal lesion near the disc. Now we started with ranibizumab initially, there was no response to fluid resolution, in fact there was new hemorrhage. So we shifted to three monthly doses of aflibercept with complete resolution. And you can see that a repeat ICG showed that the polypoidal lesion had also completely regressed. So uh, that is a very good thing with aflibercept is the polyps can also completely regress. And then we could slowly increase his treat, uh, treatment interval to Q16 and gradually he was weaned off treatment at 2 years from the onset.
then this this is a, a lady which we are currently treating bilateral amd 72 year old now you can see uh, that she has uh, significant activity we gave her one injection and you can see an immediate uh, resolution of activity and even at 4 months post first injection there is no activity but we still gave an injection because it was the better eye so we did not want to see a massive hemorrhage or something like that so even at 4 months there is no activity and an injection was given then following this injection march injection till september there is no activity but again because it's a better eye we did not want to take a risk and we injected and subsequently we don't have activity at the last visit so very long treatment intervals the other eye similar story in the other eye no activity after the first injection even at 6 months following the second injection no activity uh, but we still treat just to prevent problems now one of the findings that i had in these cases is that the the uh, oct angio also shows similar picture in both the both eyes of a given patient you see this is the right eye and this is the left eye dense medusa head like uh, uh, cnvm which starts becoming inactive with treatment and very similar response in both eyes so the two eyes of a given patient generally will respond similarly to treatment the treatment interval is almost identical and the octa morphology is also very similar in two eyes of a patient and treatment intervals of q24 or 6 months is very common in my experience with aflibacept with retention of excellent visual acuity this is another lady we are treating bilateral amd currently treating her last month last year january we started and you can see significant activity being treated with avastin with no response elsewhere so we gave her in the right eye one injection and there was very rapid re, uh, inactivation with n6 near reading vision and no activity uh, till 6 months after the injection only at 6 months we saw found fluid and we repeated the uh, injection and again after for that after that the uh, last visit no uh, activity similar picture in the left eye no activity at 5 months since injection and then at 7 months we are finding some activity and injected so again like the previous cases treatment interval of uh, 6 to 7 months and the two eyes behaving almost identically this is uh, another uh, younger lady um, who came with hemorrhage uh, she was treated with aflibacept but had a bleed so we had to put gas and tpa subsequently we gave her five loading doses but after that um, after the first injection itself she had the fluid had resolved but we gave five injections because other eye was also blind so this was one eyed case subsequently uh, in the 15 months that we have observed there has been no activity still we gave an injection at 8 months to prevent uh, uh, problems and again after that injection no activity so one injection in the last 15 months following the loading doses and vision is 6 by 6 this was our other eye we started treating in 2014 and uh, you can see no response to avastin ranibizumab she responded finally to pdt and then did not come till 2019 when she came with a very bad lesion this time we had aflibacept and you can see the dramatic response like pdt subsequently we have been able to maintain her, her on 4 to 5 monthly or 6 monthly injections uh, dry lesion these are the two eyes of the same patient particularly in bilateral peripheral pcvs aflibacept given at long intervals is ideal treatment because the margin of safety is higher in peripheral pcv so to conclude um, in my experience due to its potent activity and prolonged efficacy aflibacept has reduced the treatment burden drastically for amd pcv and other diseases and while majority of the patients we know can be extended to 2 and a half to 3 months or q12 actually there is a large proportion 30 to 40% of the patients who can be extended to up to 6 monthly uh, intervals or even 8 monthly intervals with gradual weaning off completely of treatment within 1 to 2 years of onset of the disease at least within 2 years of onset of the disease thank you uh thanks manika uh, you had one patient who stopped treatment you can said that you stopped treatment so do you Stop no, no, no. Of course not. So, how treatment do you follow? See, stop uh, the treatment. I think that gentleman who had a uh, massive RP detachment. And uh, no, I continue to see them. I uh, see it's like uh, treat and extend. If you have been able to extend your treatment interval to 
16 weeks and you gave an injection even when it was quiet. So your next visit will be two weeks or four weeks more than that. So you'll probably call them at five months. If you gave at four months and there was no activity, you'll call them probably next time at four to five months. Again, nothing. Then you'll make it six months. So, so I think. You totally stop treatment, mm. but you will still follow yes. them maybe every six months. Six months. And more importantly, I tell them to be very alert themselves, self-test their vision, because uh, they can report it best. And one patient, you said there was no activity. So for you, activity no. means fluid. You said one patient you gave injections despite no activity. You gave the initial free loading doses, and it was dry. And uh, so, you for you, activity means no fluid, or do you go by the size of the CNVM and the octa? No, no. So octa doesn't decide the treatment. Uh, I mean, I did work on it earlier. It, it octa is very, very. There are times where there is obvious significant activity, and octa does not show anything. Whereas there are times where Octa continues to show membrane, but there is no activity for months together. So Octa, I feel, is just an additional tool, but doesn't help that. So the activity is fluid. Yes, fluid so or yes, fluid or hemorrhage with some vision symptoms. So next we have a drawing of a person from Guwahati, uh, Dr. Manojit Parma, who is actually at the Shakurali Hospital. Dr. Manojit will be speaking on rating images, past, present, and future.
While we discuss this, can the next speaker please come, uh, Dr. Archana Kumari? Dr. Alok. Dr. Alok. Okay, Dr. sorry, Alok. Dr. Alok Singh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, thanks, Dr. Manjur. I guess one question I want to ask you: You use the optos, the disc photographs we can't get well with optos, so any wide field imaging systems. So, do you think that people who get a wide field imaging system should not sell off their fundus camera? No, no. Uh, optos can give a peripheral. It is useful. No, for the disc photograph. Yeah, disc photographs feel the fundus photograph is more useful, I think, because mm. fund these details are more clear in the posterior pole photograph only. Yeah. Are all the speakers there? Dr. Archana Kumari is there? Okay. Dr. Is there any other view, sir? Is there any other view, sir? No, no, I, no, I, the thing is we, we, we have a Merante uh -huh. and uh, the, the problem was the other people who want to use the system, uh, they, they are not happy with the disc photographs. 
with uh, Medantic is a much uh, better photographer uh, than most other systems, but still it is not as good as a normal uh, uh, colored photograph, which you may get with Claris. Uh, so if you can see this. cannot give the full complete details of the retina because it yeah. covers up to 200 degree in the same thing. No, I, we are talking about the color of the disc. Yeah. So the color of the disc is not captured well by it this system be because they have, uh, Optus uses three lasers, Mirante uses four lasers. So, uh, and Claris uses white light. Mm -hmm. So white light, what you get an image from the disc is totally different from what you get from a lasered based images. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. So we have Dr. Alok Sen who comes from, uh, you know, you have to be visit Chitrakut to believe what it is like. It's absolutely a miracle. Uh, the, the amount of surgery they do, the amount of OPDs they have. And uh, we have Dr. Alok Sen with us presenting on retinal vascular complication of anterior surgery. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. So as I said, I work in a very high volume uh, uh, cataract center. So we do get cases uh, referred to retina clinic uh, post-operatively. And I will be s uh, sharing some of the cases that we saw in our retina clinic. So this was a 65 year old uh, male who was who underwent a routine SICS at our center. And on first post-operative day, he presented with a fall in vision of PLPR. Anterior segment was normal. What we saw posterior in the posterior segment was this uh, whitening of the retina. And you can see on the OCT, the inner retinal hyperreflectivity suggestive of some amount of uh, vascular spasm, probably CRAO. So another case who presented to us uh, uh, immediately after cataract surgery, the cataract surgery was eventful and uh, there was a PCR and the anterior segment surgeon had the yes. Peribulbar block. Peribulbar block. Yes, sir. So all these cases were under peribulbar block. So uh, and uh, this patient had a PCR and underwent uh, anterior vitrectomy with IL placement in the sulcus. Again, similar picture, retinal whitening, and you can see on OCT the inner retinal hyperreflectivity, suggestive of uh, some compromise in central retinal artery circulation. So actually, we had a series of 14 cases which we reported in uh, 2019 when we had uh, a cluster of uh, CRO following cataract sur surgery. All these patients had uh, a uh, PCR and had undergone anti-vitrectomy. And so we were perplexed. CRO after cataract surgery have been reported and basically it could be because of vascular spasm due to anesthetic agent or the adrenaline which we at times use in along with the uh, local anesthetic agent or it could be because of the volume PCR, of PCR will be the result of maybe you must have had a high uh, yes. pressure yes sir that could be yes yes sir the problem is the, the so the what we so in this series what we identified was because <laughs> this happened in cluster it was all consecutive cases so what we could identify was that there was some issue in our ETO sterilization and probably we are contemplating that is the hypothesis because there was some residual ETO which could have led to vasospasm intraoperatively because all these patients were ETO. ETO and we changed the protocol ETO protocol and after that we did OCT in all our patients subsequent patients with uh, uh, who underwent anterior vitrectomy and we did not get so probably we were not leaving enough aeration time for ETO because that's that's the reason what we got in this cluster Obviously, we could not rule out because most of these patients. What happened, you know, sir? You know, um, uh, did all these patients recover? No, sir. Huh? No. They did not recover. Yes. So that's when we investigated what went wrong and that we could identify it. You as one of so at the time of uh, surgery, we could not, but post-operative day one, the pressures went fine. They were not, yeah, post because we don't usually do intraocular pressure checkup at the time of intraocular. But none of these patients had, uh, we do get these cases of uh, CRAO post-cataract surgery once in a while. But to get in a cluster of 14 cases in a row, and that to all patients who were undergoing anterior vitrectomy. 
and so that gave us a clue specific, yeah, specific to something which was in which all these patients had PCR the the one which we had reported right that means that yeah but yes sir having said but but what happened was because this happened in a cluster we had to search for what went wrong and once we change our protocol of aeration time from 6 hours to 48 hours after 3 days now you are using the ETO now we have stopped using ETO altogether but that suddenly uh, the cases went off so it was like in a cluster so that is what we are uh, that is the hypothesis that it can cause uh, vesospasm. Vesos yeah, that's what we thought of. Hypothesis needs to be uh, proven. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this injection was given by the same person, or there were different persons giving the. Loss? So in our uh, institute, we have different persons giving injections because it's a high volume center. So we have three, four optometrists giving injections. So they were all given by different. Uh, of optometrist. Some of them were not specific to one. And when you say cluster, it's not of the same, it's only those who had PCR. Those so who had not PCR, on not, not on the same day, no, those, so but within a month's time. So we can't call a cluster. Within a month's time. Like it was unusual to have such yeah. a high number of cases within a month's time. Is that for something? How about the, you know, the anesthetic agent? We were using lignocaine, sir, in all the patients, peribulbar block. And how about the bottle? How about the best side? Because, sir, we were this during this period, we might have operated more than thousands of cases, and only in few of we can. A uh, batch number, hai, sir, but they see they the others were not getting it. That is what we thought, sir. We don't really know. Only thing is, the positive was that once we change our protocol, we did not get subsequent because this was happening very too frequently for our comfort. Because that's when we decided. And you spot. Yes, not not relieved. It causes spasm and then probably. Can I go ahead, sir? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. So. Yes. So now we are not uting, using any more ETOs, we have plasma now, so, but that time we were really perplexed what is going wrong, it was 14 cases in one month's time was something which was not, Did you publish it? yes sir, we published in IGO, yes sir, yes. So this is uh, my third case who is a 60 year old male complained of decreased vision following one month of cataract surgery and uh, his unaided vision at the time of discharge was 618 and when he presented to us after one month he had this fundus picture of uh, localized retinal whitening with hemorrhage in the superior quadrant and you can see also the disc the upper half of the disc is also pale along with sclerosed arteries right the the OC, OCT of this patient you can see that the superior half is showing hyperreflectivity of the inner layer and this is the uh, montage view of the same patient. You can see some RP atrophy super superiorly with him scattered hemorrhages. Now this patient FFA showed uh, superior artery occlusion along with you can see this uh, RP window defect which is there in the superior quadrant. Another patient 19, I'll just come uh, with after this what went wrong in these patients. A 19 year old male who underwent a sclerocorneal tear repair at our center uh, and following this he presented with vision loss and then he had this uh, retinal whitening along with hemorrhage in the superior quadrant. So what was common in both these patients was both of these patients had received subconjunctival gentamicin. So, uh, we know that intravitreal gentamicin can lead to inadvertent uh, uh, macular ischemia, but we were surprised that even subconjunctival gentamicin can lead to transcleral uh, absorption and especially if it is given, especially it is, if it is given at the area where you have your scleral incision. So, so 
So it, it has been reported in this uh, report of 101 cases where they had 23 cases of macular infarction and where they and it has also been proven by animal studies now that it can migrate. So the take home message is if first of all we, we have stopped using gen, subconjunctal gentamicin, if at all you are using, don't give at the site of the scleral incision. So this is the last case uh, of this 60 year old female who had, hist who had hypertension and she underwent routine SICS with IL. However, you can see on the first post-operative day, she had a DM detachment. You can see on the AS OCT and she underwent a uh, DM detachment uh, repair by injection of intracameral air. And this is what uh, was observed on the first, uh, after the repair, after the DM detachment was repaired. What you can see essentially is, uh, uh, whitening of the retina which is predominantly in the peripapillary and the perifoveal area, tongue shaped whitening and this is typically what is seen in posterior ciliary artery occlusions and you can see that even on FFA there is late staining in these areas and uh, this was and on OCT what you can see is that the inner layers are almost normal so it is mostly to do with the outer retina and you can see outer retinal hyperreflectivity over here. So this is a posterior ciliary artery spasm which we uh, we encountered in a patient who had undergone DM repair uh, due to air pro possibly because of the increase in trochlear pressure which has occurred. So retinal vascular accidents are rare but devastating and some of these may not have improvement in vision. And many of these cases can be prevented uh, if uh, proper interop or post-op precautions can be taken. Thank you so much. Wonderful. You know, there's a lot of learning from all this and you know, some other precautions which we may be able to do. Thank you. Thank you. If your transcleral migration of it's only happens, then we should be very careful even injecting, uh, when we are doing a buckling, buckling, we do antibiotic wash. Yeah. We should avoid doing onycacin or Especially if we are creating any tunnel or we are ah, reducing the, the opening the wound. So that's when the she migration is more. And in the first case, if you can see, it was given the superior quadrant and you can see that there was a migration and you can see RP atrophy and superior half is was involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's not talking on laser versus no laser of polygon border in polygon is a prominent veterinary surgeon from Patna. Uh, while we are talking about Kuruma, that is a great artery, definitely it is associated with it. 
storage is still in the primary position and then pass it through from the bank. It will secure the door sheet at the end. After that, parts, plan and entry was done with 25 volt system, code and peripheral digital was done. Here, after uh, you can see the HRSC was being basically quarterized, following which quick cash exchange was done from the HRSC, which resulted in settling of the retina. After this, a good endorizer was done of the break, peripheral break. This was followed by final facts from the disc and the coloma also. Uh, and then finally, silicon oil insertion was done. So, post of B1 pressure was on under oil, there was good bank local effect, and patient had 660 division. Now, the case 2 is coloma related retinal detachment, which was in a 16 year old unfortunate boy who was one eyed, and his right eye vision was hand movement for the last two years. His IOP was 938, so after managing IOP, we uh, took up the patient for surgery. This was group C uh, type, which we saw in the pictorial depiction. And there was a uh, intercalary memory break, however, and detachment of the retina, but there was no peripheral break. So a total RD, no peripheral break, ICM detachment, and ICM break. It was diagnosed with total RD in type 1 coloma. We took up the patient for heart scan and retinae. And uh, after both sides and both retinae, uh, uh, we did uh, lesser filling because patient was having cataract and these patients need very good peripheral uh, shave. So PVT and peripheral retinae was done ridiculously. Followed by this, though I have an eye treatment, peripheral break should always be avoided. A fluid and gas exchange was attempted from the intercalary memory break as well as the peripheral break, but because the difference is settled many times, the local scientist resistance uh, deficits are not good enough to uh, uh, do a very good fast. So I did a retinal thing, and finally the endoliza was done of the retinal thing, as well as the border of the uh, coloma was meticulously laser with 360 degree uh, laser tool. After this, a fluid gas exchange from the coloma margin and was done, and silicon oil insertion was done. So this case, uh, on post of day one, had uh, retina on and visual acuity, finger counting close to four pigs. It was still periodic. So, the take home message is that a uh, laser versus no laser form coloma border. The coloma and the attachment is a very truly question for all the retina surgeons. And we also land up uh, lasering the coloma border because these uh, retinal detachments are very prone to ERDs. However, uh, the take home message is that if I see break and I see detachment is there, it warrants lasering of coloma uh, when you're associated with the original detachment. Thank you. Thank you, sir, respected chairperson. Thank you, AOS, for this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on uh, PDR and PVR. So this was actually uh, one of the first few cases which I started operating under 3D visualization system. Uh, so I was really skeptical because they said it has a very long learning curve and the peripheral visualization is not there, the lag is not there and everything. So just here you can see it was a very uh, but a PDR with, uh, you can see, the almost like a tabletop TRD. So thanks to these modern gauge cutters, where you can do this segmentation and delamination, most of these with the help of the cutter itself. But when it comes to periphery, uh, I, I don't think uh, any surgeon hesitates to go bimanual, because you can see the periphery is pretty much sclerotic and very thin and necrotic retina. So I didn't want to take chance with the help of cutter itself. So here you are showing the, the fold back delamination as described by Steve Charles here uh, just trying to. So the key here is remove as much as membrane as possible up to the ex extreme periphery because there are the chances where we go in for the PVR. 
Now I'm just removing the, the next bit of these membranes uh, on this side. And finally, removing, after removing most of these membranes, I put a PFO and did a peripheral base shaving and then lasering the edges. Silicon oil was injected and luckily the patient improved 2018 in this. It's a silicon oil filled eye, so it's a reflexes which came into that. The, bo the both eye had a similar picture, but uh, I think she was happy with one surgery and did not agree for the other. So this is the another uh, case of PDA surgery. Now we have shifted using the, the, uh, the color filters. So here you can see it's a case of again, uh, where you have to do a bimanual surgery in these membranes. So wh what's the advantage of using these color filters? You saw that uh, the bloody red which was there, it gets reduced. So while you have to do a bimanual segmentation, these membranes, they try to fluoresce uh, under that uh, you have to adjust the gamma, hue, saturation and most of these settings when you do it, it you, ca you can see these membranes try to get a fluorescent kind of hue. So that definitely helps us in, in the, when it is especially mixed with the blood and a thin necrotic retina. So this is how I just wanted to show that how easily we can get through with these uh, bimanual membranes using the various filters, especially here what I'm using is the reduced red filter and the green filter. So again, you can make a mix match of whatever uh, best suits your hand. So coming to the next, this is again, uh, you can see here, this was a, a case of uh, again a TRD. And uh, I'll, not, I'll just try to forward it. So I just wanted to show it to the, the fellows or the residents here. It's a good case to uh, show about the segmentation. So how we do the segmentation? It's just simple as the example which was given by my mentor. When you have a bridge, just cut across the bridge that is the segmentation and what is delamination when you just cut across the pillar which is attached to the bridge that is the delamination so here i'm just trying to showcase uh, the segmentation with the help of the cutter and once we segment it you can do a multiple piece segmentations and then you can do the delamination so this whole surgery was done with the cutter itself as you can see here, I have never used a forceps in any of these so thanks to these uh, 10k cutters with the slight beveled uh, of these uh, uh, the end so that you it acts like a forceps also and definitely with a good uh, a cut rate cut speed it uh, with a controlled uh, this thing and now you can see I'm just doing a delamination here so similarly all these uh, the membranes were removed with the help of cutter itself you can see I'm just and finally uh, the ILM peeling was done and the air was injected in this case and this is the post-op picture the patient had a pretty good visual recovery in this case so moving to the next pvr cases extreme gate pvr so this was a bo unfortunate boy 15 year old who got hit with uh, twice with uh, football and the tennis ball unfortunately and that too within a span of 15 days so it was almost like a, a closed funnel um, it, it, it is a closed funnel already and the challenge here was to do uh, the vitrectomy and try to unfold this membrane as much as possible. Now here I am using the light pipe and the cutter to, to open up that uh, closed funnel RD and then step by step PFCL injection is very very important in these kind of cases. And then you know that the peripheral, uh, the traction which is persisting you have to do the uh, retinectomy, try to remove as much as membranes as possible, the subretinal gliotic bands as much as possible and here you can see there was a, a temporary traction still left so again I had to remove most of these traction and finally I could see a well settled retina but after one month this was the picture so I thought it has went into PVR again and it has caused the closed funnel again so here I could not see the pupil at all so the membrane was very badly adherent and you can see even the, the corneal uh, neovascularization also had started. So I had to do a pupillectomy with the help of the cutter and surprisingly when I went inside I could see that only the inferior part of the retina was lifted and the silicon oil had gone underneath that part of the retina. So uh, indicating that there was a traction in that area. So I just did a little more retinectomy and with the help of the fluid air exchange as you know silicon oil is lighter than water it floats so you can remove the silicon oil easily and then whatever traction was there was removed and finally uh, the laser was done and uh, luckily the patient had around 3 by 60 kind of vision so that itself I think is the, the happiness in the 
the VR surgeon's life, not 6 6 or 6 uh, 20 then cataract surgeries. So, this is the another case, a bad case, uh, as you can see the foreign body here and with the retinal detachment with the vitreous hemorrhage. So, the vitreous altered vitreous hemorrhage was cleared. The challenge here was to remove this foreign body and I tried to use an MVR blade so that I can use this magnet. So, here I try to remove uh, the foreign body but it fell down. I tried to remove it with the forceps again it fell down. So finally I had to use the vectus below and then with the help of the dialer I had to just squeeze it out and you can see because of the irregular shape of that foreign body it was very difficult to remove through the scleral wound. And the next challenge was to settle the RD in this bad cornea and finally I could get a good view and you can see the retinal detachment was settling well and then uh, not just that even the ILM peeling was also done in this case. So these are the kind of cases where you have to find your way to improve the visualization in these kind of cases. In the interest of time I think I will this so these are the different kind of surgeries which we did under the 3D visualization even in the bad corneas also we could settle the retina pretty well. This was just a last 30 seconds I'll take sir extremely sorry. So this was a case who was admitted to the blind school. He was a 14 year old boy and uh, when we do the yearly blind school uh, follow up. Uh, so this was the case almost uh, uh, the, the retina was seen behind the lens as you can see here. So here uh, it's always better to remove as much as possible under the microscope itself before going in for uh, the endo illumination. So infusion then passed on and then now you can see the, the, the membranes there. So meticulously it, uh, it has to be peeled first trying with the periphery and then uh, try to use the bimanual if required. I'm just fast forwarding it in the interest of time and then now you can see after the removal of these most of these membrane and here uh, luckily we could remove most of these membranes without doing much retinectomy in this case. So the peripheral barrier laser was done and the brakes were lasered and finally the retina uh, was attached well. So thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you.
during the uh, four period polar case and the effort is to, to me. You can see this without the object to be through the seen through the screen, we have parted the things and more detailed things can be seen in a depth. You can see from the cornea, iris and behind the iris also and uh, just mm -hmm. ruptured PC. Uh, very well. And the rest of the surgery is possible. This is one of the cases where you can see that uh, in routine microscope, the field of view is very less. Here you can see the things in a detail. Detail means uh, in a natural color as well as the, the mm -hmm. depth. Apart from the depth, the field, the field of view is also very big. So the mistakes which occur usually in the uh, microscopes are uh, very rare or not at all uh, in, uh, if you are using the uh, wide field 3D uh, visualization system here also you can see uh, details of the PVD as well as the epilator and membrane peeling and the, in the single glass you can see the beyond the arcades uh, this nasal studies and uh, temporal to the uh, almost uh, up to the equator the inner one, uh, one more you can see this is another case, both cases uh, are in a sleep on a remote case with the epilator and membrane. You can see there how, how nicely one can delineate the membrane and in a natural color again. And uh, the light required here is around 10 to 15 percent only. Otherwise, we use around 50 percent, 60 percent of the light. And uh, the whole area is uh, under your cover, like if you are driving a car or if you if you are driving the SOV, then your height is more and your uh, uh, whole road is in, 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 in your uh, view. This is again the vital areas you can do very much, very much well. Previously I used to start the eye feeling in that, so we have now I have started in the back of my car, and you can see that in fine details also it is possible and to uh, tell you that these cases are done within the first 15 days of the when I got the system, now I have again to experience more and more and having confidence in doing the surgery without the objective of the microscope. You can see that initially you are a little hesitant, but once you are used to system, nothing is difficult. And even in the iron milling, you can see the natural colors also and the area which is been seen in is a white, white milk which is seen. And the natural then another difficult cases also you can uh, do using this 3D. Here it is the advantage of this one over the microscope is that uh, you can do the surgery from everywhere. This is the up to equator, equator to equator area in, in your grid. So uh, you know where to start the feeling, where you are, uh, what are the edges, and you get a good plane to do the surgery, uh, which usually otherwise is not possible. Here you are seeing the picture in a 50 inch uh, screen. While in a microscope it is 1.5 uh, in the RY 20 mm. Here you can see that these membranes are being removed very nicely and the complications even in a difficult cases are very less.
session. Please come. Okay, see ya. Don't tell me all, don't tell me all.